Welcome to the Robert Dust Podcast. I got two special guests, kind of co-hosts with me today. John Hitchens, how you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, Rob. Thanks for having me on. John Hitchens has a mental health awareness and advocacy group with a prescription for wholeness, RX for wholeness. And I was like, you know who you need to talk to? You need to talk to Chancellor Jackson, because I talked to him a while back about his experience in China and I was like, if there's someone that, you know, has probably dealt with mental health and at least mental toughness, I'm like it's Chancellor. Yeah, so, yeah. John, say hi to Chancellor. Hey, Chancellor, how you doing? Hey, man, blessings and balance to both of you. Blessings and balance to everyone that's tuning in right now. Big shout out to the viewers. They're the real MVPs. So, shout out to them. No, absolutely. So, Chancellor, start off with your story just a little bit here. Give us the Give us the 10,000-foot view. We'll use a lot of pilot analogies here because we got John as a fighter pilot here with us. So, well, like, what happened? Like, you got detained in China. Mm-hmm. How'd you get there? Yeah, so um, after I graduated from college, um, Stetson University, with a degree in communication and media studies, I ironically landed my first job teaching English to children in China. So that's how I ended up out there. Um, I was teaching kids as young as three years old all the way up to 14, and I entered China on October 10th, 2018. And my contract was set for a year. I was living my best life, experiencing all that, you know what I'm saying, China had to offer. And then on April 4th, 2019, about six months in, things take a turn. Oh, <laughs> so no. And, um, of course, I'm arrested. And then I served 14 days in the Beijing Penitentiary. Um, after my release, I was immediately deported from the country. I came back to America. I was pretty much back at square one all over again. And, um, from there on, that's where I was able to really find myself, for real, for real. Wow. So, so, so what was it? So, we have a fighter pilot on who I was always curious. Like, did you ever fly over enemy territory, where you'd get shot down and have to go to an enemy prison? No, I did not. I was never uh, in any part of the country where, uh, other than the U.S. Uh, no, there were <laughs> some Europe places. I but neither of those are a high threat. The, the highest threat I ever had was actually flying with uh, American Airlines when we went into Russia airspace, and they have some uh, serious regulations and, and different procedures that you got to comply with. And they talk about, you know, being shot down if you don't based on their missile system going in there. So it was not a, a, a good feeling. We were really tense going in there probably more than any time. But um, when you get as a fighter pilot, when you get trained, they they teach you about getting shot down and how to handle that. And uh, it, we're taught by guys that got shot down in Vietnam, which was if uh, you know anything about what they went through, uh, that's some scary stuff. So it, it depends on which country you get shot down on, what they think of life and human life in particular. And some of them uh, don't have a high regard for that, so they treat you that way. And the guys in Vietnam got brutalized a lot. So uh, they, we were taught a lot on how to handle that and, and what to do about it. Uh, but yeah, you just never want to. You, you never want to be down on that other side. <laughs> No, absolutely. So, Chancellor, what was your then, what was, you know, day one for you like in a chi- in a Chinese prison? Um, so, day one is just pretty much all the processing, you know what I'm saying? So, they arrest me inside of my apartment, um, then they take me to one precinct. We're at that first precinct for about, like, 20 minutes. Really, I'm just sitting there. I don't know what's going on. I'm just sitting there reflecting, um, just talking to myself and just, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't know what's going to take place. Um, but when it's all said and done, I know I'm going to be good. I know I'm still, my mental still going to be attacked. My spirit still going to be strong. Like I'm still going to be me. Um, I just don't know how this thing going to play out. So with that being said, take note of every minor detail because it's going to be a great story to tell once you're out of this predicament. Um, so they come get me. We get to, we get back in the van. I have no clue where we're going. Um, we arrive at another precinct. This one's a little bigger, and they have uh, holding cells in this one. So they throw me in the holding cell with about eight other Chinese dudes, and I'm in there for about 20 minutes before they come get me, and then they take me down to the basement of the precincts. And then we enter this white room, and in this white room is an uh, electric chair, or well, all metal chair that looks like an electric chair. Across from the, elect- uh, the metal chair is a regular six-foot table with chairs, like regular table chairs, um, uh, across from it, and then you got a camera sitting on the tripod capturing the whole room. So they walk me over to the chair, and they open it up, and they looking at me. And I'm looking back at them. <laughs> I look at the chair, look back at them, look at the chair again. <laughs> look back at them, like, y'all really want me to sit down in this type of chair? 
And they looking at me with a straight face. So I sat down. <laughs> you feel me? <laughs> that thing like my shins, thighs, waist, chest, and arms all in one place. The only part of my body I could move was my head. So I did my whole interrogation locked into this chair. Um, but by this time, they gave me plenty of time to come up with a good story to finesse them with. So I gave them my fabricated story. Um, there was one officer asking all the questions. The other officer was transcribing the whole thing. So they bring the transcription over for me to read. And mind you, it's all written in Mandarin. So I have no clue what this thing says. But they say to sign it. I sign it. They say thumbprint. I thumbprint it. And they release me from the chair. So we go wow. upstairs, um, do my mugshot, handprint, and then they throw me back in the holding cell. And now I'm just reflecting on everything that has transpired f- from the apartment to the interrogation, what I could have did better at the apartment, what I could have said better during the interrogation. Just coming up with just different scenarios. But all in all, I was damned either way. Um, so I'm just... What, what, what was your thought of the future at this point when you're going, am I going to be in here a week, two weeks, a year? What were, what were you kind of mentally preparing for? I have no clue. I have no clue. Honestly, I'm just in the moment, really, just taking it step by step. You know what I'm saying? Controlling what I can control, and that's just me and how I'm choosing to uh, handle this situation mentally. You know what I'm saying? So, um, just, you know what I'm saying? Just staying level. Did anybody ever. Can't get, too high, can't get too low. Did anybody in that time period that you just talked about, did anybody tell you why? They wanted you, why they wanted to talk to you, what they were thinking was going um, on, and what they were accusing well, you of. I was in, before they showed up to my apartment, I was pre gaming. I'm, I'm thinking you're ready to leave to head to like a team builder event that my company is uh, hosting. And we was going to be customizing our own Chinese fans. So before I went, I'm like, I'm a pre game. So I'm in the apartment drinking some Chinese liquor, smoke some cannabis at my little pipe, and I get done, get dressed, finna get ready to walk out the door, and that's where I heard a knock. And guests are not familiar, so I'm curious to see who it is. Look to the people, and there stood three officers from the Beijing police. So from that point on, they drug test me right there in the apartment. And after I failed the drug test, oh yeah, it was really a rap after that. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a rap after that. So that's how we got to, you know what I'm saying, that's what we had the second precinct now, and I'm just reflecting on everything that happened at the apartment to the interrogation, what I could have did better, what I could have said better. But with me failing that drug test, I was going to end up in the same predicament regardless. So, um, it is what it is. Like it is what it is. So time is continuing to pass. Um, it's a window in the cell. So every time I look up at the window, the sun is just fading more and more until it's just still uh-huh. darkness. And um, they come get me from the cell. They bring my basket of clothes and tell me to get dressed. So I'm like, oh, snap back. You ain't said nothing but a word. I done got dressed. I'm waiting for the next set of orders. Um, they had me follow them through a front door, or through a door that's behind the front desk in the lobby. And as we enter through this door, we're in the hallway. At the end of the hallway, it's a small room crowd of officers. Can't really make heads or tails what this room is, but I'm finna learn soon enough. <laughs> so I'm following the CO, and as I enter the room, I can only assume that this is some form of evidence room. I see evidence bags everywhere. No sense of structure, organization, nothing. It's just hoarded, like just stuff mm-hmm. everywhere. But um, it's a table in the center of the room, and in the middle of the table is everything that was confiscated from my apartment. So one officer sits down, and he weighs the weed up right there in front of me. Now, this is an interesting phase within the book because as a reader, you're curious to know how much does he actually have on him, one. Two, when have you ever saw law enforcement weigh whatever they just confiscated from you right there in front of you? I thought that was interesting. And then three, as you can tell, I'm not really receiving any type of information. I'm really learning as I go. That's the premise of the whole story. I'm here to tell y'all I did 14 years. As you read the book, you are going through this experience and you don't have no clue what's going to happen. You just, you know what I'm saying? You just learn as you go. Um, and nothing is explained to you. Um, so with that being said, the only vital signs that I did receive was from my ancestors, my higher powers, my guardian angels, whatever you want to refer to them as. And it was the first sign I received from them. And the only live and action sign I received. The other signs occurred in my dreams. So he um, weighs up the cannabis and tells that to be 1.4 grams. Now, for those that partake in cannabis, you know 1.4 grams isn't a lot. Even if you don't partake in cannabis, we're talking units of measurement. 1.4 grams of anything isn't a lot. So I didn't have much on me. But... You look at that number, 1.4. It's a decimal, right? So, for example, I got this whiteboard behind me, right? So say I write 1.4 on this uh, on this board. It's backwards for y'all, but it's 1.4 on this board. And I just erase this decimal. What number do you see? 14. Hence the title of the book, 
Now, did I catch that sign initially? Absolutely not. Went clean over my head, but that was the very first thing I received. Let me know how long I was going to be in this situation. Um, so they put everything back on pa- on paper. I can't read it worth the damn, but they say sign it. I sign it. They say thumb print. I thumbprint it. So now we get back in the van. I look at the uh, radio. The clock is one o'clock in the morning. They arrested me at like eleven a.m. So I'm like, bro, I've been in custody all day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I ain't ate nothing, drunk nothing. Like, but um, don't work with y'all. Energy been good. Like, there's no way they're not taking me home. There's no way. So we ride in, about 40, 50 minutes pass, and we arrive at a facility detailed with tall walls and barbed wire. Oh. It's like, oh, yeah, we just getting started. <laughs> so, what, yeah. what was going through your head at that point when you're going, like you said, you think you're going home and you're now right. going to, you know, a prison? What are you, what's what's keeping you going now? I just dropped my head. I was just like, fuck. <laughs> For real. Like, I'm like, I was just ho- hoping they should have let me go. I was like, nah, we it look like we just getting started, family. This ain't over with yet. So I'm like, all right, let's see. We're going to see. I still don't know what we finna do. So we get we into the facility, um, go to the nurse's office, do a quick physical, take me to another room to get my official jail uniform. And they gave me a plastic bowl and a plastic spoon. And we went upstairs to the second floor to where the manor house, and we get to cell 209. Mind you, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning at this point, so of course folks are asleep. The CO opens his door, and instantly my psych is thrown by the setup of the cell. The setup of the cell is nothing but a big rectangle, I say about 15 yards in length, 10 yards in width. Um, you take one big solid step into the cell, and that's where the beds begin. So, and the beds are number of wooden planks with covers underneath them, and they start from there and stretch all the way to the back of the cell. So, on top of the wooden beds, I describe it. It looks like a slumber party. You know what I'm saying? All the inmates, it look like a slumber party the way they're sleeping on them. But, ironically enough, weird, well, weirdly enough, it's two inmates, Chinese inmates, wide awake, standing up against the wall, watching the rest of them sleep. So. Of course, we they awake, we make eye contact. <laughs> the last thing them folks expected to see come walking through this door was a brother with locks. <laughs> the last thing I expected to see was these two Chinese folks watching other Chinese folks sleep. So we just got this awkward moment of <laughs> eye contact trying to figure each other out, like what's going on in here? And I do a head count. So including me, it's 15 of us in this cell. All right, I count the beds, nine in total. Well, it makes sense why it looks like a slumber party then. You know what I'm saying, folks? <laughs> yeah, you gotta make room. Um, to the left wow. is the bathroom. It's its own separate room. You got a regular sink and then a squat toilet. So pretty much a hole in the ground. You got to squat over it. Anybody that didn't the Asian know about those. Um, the shower ain't nothing but a water hose and the shower head duct tape together. You got black mold coating the walls, gnats and stuff flying around. So it's not the most sanitary place to say the least. Huh. Uh, I approach the slumber party. I'm trying to find a spot to lie down. <laughs> and one of the inmates that's taking watch wakes two people up to make room for me. And I, they had me set my bowl and my spoon in the cubbies up underneath the uh, beds. So I laid down between these two Chinese dudes with my hands on my chest, and I'm staring at the bright light on the ceiling. <laughs> That's when reality fully kicked in, like, hey, <laughs> we in here, boy. Nothing, we don't know how long we're going to be in here. Nothing has been explained to us as far as how the process works, how the jail even operates. Nobody knows we're in here. We're more than likely the only English speaker in the cell right now, so it ain't like we can talk to these people and try to get an idea for how this thing works. Wow. It's not really looking too good, but I got to hold myself accountable. I made a conscious decision that I knew the repercussions from, and now that shit has hit the fan, and here we are. There's nobody that I can place the blame on but myself, so it is what it is in regards to that. I got to take this to the chin, however it's going to play out. Now, moving forward, what needs to take place to speed up this process? Well, people got to realize you in here, one, um, you're supposed to meet um, colleagues and friends at that event today. But you didn't show up. I'm Did sure any of them reached out to try to figure out to find out where you were that you knew of? Now, like in, in hindsight, talking to those people probably. You said what? Did they did they try to reach out for you, like knowing that you didn't show up to where you were supposed to be? Oh yeah, they, yeah. they called me. They called me. I didn't answer. I'm like, they, I'm sure because they knew I was gonna show up. I'm telling you, yeah, I'm finna pull up, woo-woo, so they knew I was coming. So the fact that I didn't show up, I, they, I'm sure they called. I didn't answer them. I'm like, okay, that's weird. That's not a red flag, but it's weird. Now, yeah, I don't show up for work. Saturday and Sunday, our busiest days of the week, all hell is breaking loose because now they got to find somebody to cover all my classes last minute. And one of those colleagues I was going to meet at that event, me and her worked at the same school. And she from Atlanta, too. So she already going to know. All right, he ain't show up to the event. Now he ain't showing up for work. Red flag. Something's wrong. All right, I'm like, boom, that's one phase. Other phase was I had a girlfriend at the time. 
And we talked regularly. I said, when I don't respond to her messages, all hell is breaking loose. So I'm going like, oh, to have to at least sit through the weekend before I become missing on people's radar. So it's Friday morning now. Hopefully come Monday, um, the search for me will begin then. So we're just going to cross that bridge when we get to it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wow. Yeah, we're locked wow, up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 15 men to one cell, nine wooden beds, three soups a day. And literally all I had was that one plastic bowl and that one plastic spoon <laughs> for those 14 days. I mean, you hear so many horror stories of people uh, being in foreign countries and get picked up, and, I mean, it's it's brutal. I mean, it's not, you know, we complain about our prison system, but <laughs> it's nothing <laughs> like the stories you hear over there. I mean, it's not even close. Man, I mean, it, it is. It, you know, it's like a Hilton over here in our prison compared to <laughs> what they do over there. It can get pretty ugly in some at. of those places. Depending on where you at sometimes. Yeah. I, depending on where you at, some some folks, some places, facilities here in America, shit, I, yeah, I they ain't too either, space but, thing all over again yeah. before I get locked up in any hardcore prison out here. No cap. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably no true. Cap. So, so then, what what are you thinking? As you're, you said you got you got a few days. You like before the search really starts. You know, people start figuring out where you're at. What's your hope like at that point? Even like of the U.S. like embassy or you know the equivalent in China saying, hey, why is our guy in your prison system? Yeah, I was just like, somebody, gonna, they're going to start looking for me, and um, I know they're going to start doing some real investigating, and they're going to figure out, you know, it ain't going to be hard for them to figure out if I, you know, something that I'm in here, especially once they run my information, they'll be able to see I, I then got arrested. So I'm like, for sure, I just don't know how long the process will take. But I'm just hoping Monday, <laughs> that's when they'll start looking for me. You know what I'm saying? But I have no clue how long. I, I can't control anything. We in this cell, and we don't leave it. <laughs> so it's like, really, bro, I can so, only control me. So you never really left that, you know, that cell with the 15 other or 14 other guys? The only time I left that cell was when I was moved to a new cell on day four, chapter four. And um, day seven, to me with immigration, and then day 10, to me with the U.S. Embassy. Aside from that, you don't leave that cell. Wow, man! I I get frustrated when I get stuck in my house for more than like two days in a row. I got a nice house. <laughs> oh, me, oh, me! It was and it was crazy to come back to America and you fast forward a calendar year and COVID pop off. And if you catch COVID, what they make you do? Quarantine for how long? Two weeks. Two weeks. Fourteen crazy. days. Crazy. Yeah. I was like, wow, universal, <laughs> universal. <laughs> what are the odds of that? Wow. So, John, what do you think? Like, would you have, how have you done if you ever got shot down over China? I don't know. I, because we had been trained a little bit, I might have been able to handle it. But without that training, I'm not sure I would have done it uh, well. Um, getting that uh, information helps you. And, like this, we know as American, you know, pilots or whatever that they don't leave anybody behind. So, like him, like Chancellor's talking about, we, we we knew people were coming for us, wanting to get us out, trying to get us out. Uh, even when you go down, you know, we we know that they don't – I mean, they, that's why we go across the FIBA, across the battlefield, is because we know somebody's coming after us. They're not going to just leave us. So they're going to make every effort to get us before we get into their hands, and so that's a, a, a great a motivator to keep going across if you have to. But, uh, Chancellor, when when did you finally know? Did it take – 14 days or 12 days or whatever to know that someone was actually on your behalf looking when did you finally figure out that hey this may someone at least knows now when did you finally get that word that someone outside knew you were in there um on day seven when i was able to make contact with you know what I'm saying well they allowed us to use our phones because we met with immigration so his job was pretty much like all right i need to find somebody uh, well, you need to find somebody that can buy you a plane ticket for whenever your time is up from here. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's what our, 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 they collected all the foreigners in the jail. They took us downstairs, and he met with us individually um, to see who can buy us a plane ticket. So we, it's like 30 of us down there, and it's just one of him. And I'm in the middle of the line, so I took it upon myself to reach out to as many people as I could. To tell, you know what I'm saying? I'm in the tap I'm, I'm just messing with you. I made a, uh, I wrote a long little message, and I'm just copying and pasting because I ain't got time to call everybody. Yeah. I'm talking about my phone. It took about two, three minutes for my phone to relax after I, talked, wow. you know, I had so many messages and calls. So just trying to message as many people as I could. Start calling the morning radio show in town like, hey, I need a ticket to get out of China. Man. I'm just letting people know, hey, boy, lay low. You know what I'm saying? This is what's going on. And then by the time he got to me, 
He's, you know what I'm saying? He asked me, oh, who can buy you a plane ticket? I'm like, I can pay for my own. I got plenty of money. He's like, nah, I need somebody else. So I'm like, only other person who number I know by heart is my mama. So I get on the phone, or I call her, and um, <laughs> she answered the phone. I was like, what's going on? She's like, you tell me. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm all up right now. She's like, yeah, I got an uh, email from the U.S. Embassy Let me know what was going on. Um, ironically enough, your brother is dropping me off at the airport right now, and I'll be in Beijing tomorrow about 5 p.m. I was like, oh, damn. Wow. All right. So I was like, I said, hey, my mama said she'd be here tomorrow. He said, tell her to turn around. It ain't nothing she can do because <laughs> she got your plane ticket. I was like, uh, Dukes, he said, ain't nothing you can do, but can you buy this plane ticket? She's like, yeah, I can buy the plane ticket, but I'll be in Beijing tomorrow. I'm like, all right. She said she could buy it. He said, all right, hang up the phone. I said, all right, I got to go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> it wasn't even like it was a long conversation. You know what I'm saying? I just knew that she was going to be in China the next day. And then the next day came, I ain't hear nothing. Next day after that, I ain't hear nothing. You know what I'm saying? I still ain't hear nothing. Then I meet with the U.S. Embassy on day 10. He was just like, well, there ain't really much that we can do on our end. Uh, we just here to make sure they ain't treating you inhumanely or nothing like that. But as far as your process, that's all in China's hands. So <laughs> if you got anybody else you want us to contact, you know what I'm saying? Here go a little sheet you can fill out, and we'll, we'll reach out to them and let them know. But aside from that, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you do to stay sane in those times? Like, to, like did you, like... Could you like do jumping jacks in the in your cell with like fifteen guys? Did you do, like a calisthenics class or? So in the, you... in the first three days, I was it was just a lot of reflecting, honestly. Um, just because I'm the only foreigner in there, so I really can't talk to nobody. So I was just reflecting a whole lot, full seventy two hours to reflect. And um, on day four, and that's when I moved to the new set, and I got other people to talk to. That's when the quote misery loves company comes into play oh it's lit now you know what i'm saying i got best friends and we man you'd have thought we grew up with each other the way we was tapping in like for real for real so it was just cool to um just finally have somebody to talk to and of course we just killing a lot of time just you know what i'm saying kept learning about each other and not only can i speak to these new foreigners but they pretty much they all fluent in mandarin so i can i can talk to the chinese inmates now as well because we got translators so now you're learning about all these different characters their different backgrounds what made them end up in uh the jail and all that so it, it, that's when things get a little interesting in the book i taught a uh, I did an English lesson one day in the cell to some of the uh, Chinese inmates. So with the whole lesson, just teaching them alphabets and you know what I'm saying how to blend words and all this, that, and the other. Um, but you know, I'm just, I really at that, point were, at that um, point were you teaching them swear words too? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, they wanted to learn about all of that. I mean, we got nothing but time on our hands, so <laughs> <What's it? yeah. laughs> let's That's do it. That's what's amazing because when we talk about people who struggle and that are on our platform, the isolation is one of the things that truly gets them to you know to where suicide and all kind of bad things happen so when they start to isolate it starts to fall apart for them yes. that was forced on you and you and the story of how you have to keep your mental health going as far as what you said like reflecting and like uh, for us if we have a biblical or things like that spiritual stuff that you can do that helps you but it's amazing how when you get even one person in there that you can talk to how that hey you're in this whole with me as well me. <laughs> how that immediately gives you hope that you know you got someone else and and you have several someone else's that just really uh and that's what it's all about is trying to find and connect people when we talk about mental health that give you that that have those intimate connections and every hard time i've ever went through whether it was you know flight training or survival school or any of the stuff i went through those type of people that i met in there it, it became like lifetime friends you know you immediately have you have something really powerful in common now and it, it becomes a really a molding intimate type thing that you become so it's amazing that that happens even there and it, and, and it can happen like we're releasing a platform that people can get on and do exactly that make those critical connections that can keep them alive no facts yeah we definitely tapped in you know what i'm saying we I, we partners for life now we all got locked up in china together <laughs> oh, come on <laughs> you know what i'm so, saying hey, bro <laughs> me for real <laughs> Like like when people have those, you know, you're at a house party or something. So like, what's the craziest thing that's happened to you? <laughs> oh, I got. Hey, man, hey, every time I bring that up, just yeah, I got locked up right in China. I can't. It's like the whole energy shifts and like everybody just tunnels in and just starts focusing on what I'm saying. Like I got everybody's undivided attention. It'd be crazy every single time. <laughs> what, what, you, ever, you ever thought like what? how this has become a platform for you then like you know you know 14 days in you're probably like hey i'm just excited to go get home and get a burger 
Man, nah, what well, for real? You know what I'm saying? But then, then it turns into now a stage or a platform for you. Facts. <laughs> well, I, so I, want to, I want to comment on your mama, man, running out there like <laughs> oh, I'm in tomorrow, and you're like, "That's mama, man. She's going to take me, care." Well, of I was like, "Damn." <laughs> <laughs> Man, what is, and that's just amazing to have a mom like that. I mean, that's phenomenal that she would race out there and, and try to do whatever she could to help you. So that's pretty cool. If you're oh, ever neat. trying to get, surprise her with a trip, go out to Hawaii and be like, hey, I'm locked up in Hawaii. You <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a little different than Beijing, but we're going to have some hey, fun. Nah, for real. Nah, for yeah. real. No, that, that's awesome. And then you wrote the book, 14, what was the title of the book, 14 Days in, a, in Beijing. Beijing Prison? Yeah, so um, what inspired that? Um, I when I was a lot of the reflecting I was doing in Beijing Jail Six, I knew I needed to link up with one of my friends that I grew up with. Um, his name is Demarco Reddins. So I was like, but I just need to link up because I know I'm gonna tell him about the story. We're gonna powwow, and we're gonna be able to come up with something to do something with the story, like with this experience. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna figure something out, and shit. Lo and behold, we was kicking it, powwow, and uh, he was like, "Hey, you ain't think about writing a book?" About the experience, I was like, "Well, that's a good ass idea." I don't even know where to start, but that's a great idea. He even took it further, took my phone, went to my note section, left me a little outline, and I just started filling in the outline. And with me doing that, I caught a flow for how I wanted to tell the story. So I moved it from the notes on my phone uh, to a Google Doc so I could type it up. Four months later, the story was written, and then just spent the additional six months just getting it ready for publishing. And um, I got locked up in China on April fourth, twenty nineteen. On April 4th, 2020, the anniversary date, I released the very first version of 14 Days in Beijing, and I was ranked the number one new bestseller in three different genres. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. That's awesome. That's great. And I don't think an AI bot could write that story. (laughs) Nah. Nah. Hell nah. Nah. What? For real, for real. Strictly from these eyes. (laughs) For real. No. No, very cool. So, John, like when you mentioned, like you went through training, so something happened to you over enemy territory. What was it, some of that training that, like, if you could have been to Chancellor, like, before that, like, what, what was some of that training like? Well, especially uh, when you have guys that went through some really bad stuff, they have all kind of techniques to teach you how to, like, you got to remember, as a military guy, part of the interrogation is they're trying to get uh, very critical information, especially right away, because each day you're in there, the information that you have gets old. So they're trying to get information out of you. And we used to have, back in World War II, it was rank, serial number, name, rank, and serial number. That's all you could give. If you gave anything else, you were violating a military code. So when you get back, you could get court-martialed for giving information. Well, they realized that they'd never been up against, you know, people like in the Vietnamese were doing to where they're, you know, basically torturing them. And, you know, guys would give a little information and, and they'd be just horrified that they did that because now they knew that they were, you know, not only did they get the crap beat out of them, but now they're, they're breaking laws that are going to get them thrown in jail when they get back. And so eventually what the military figured out is that isn't going to work. And so you give them as little as possible till they quit beating you. And then, you know, the next day, the same thing. You go as long as you can, and then you give them as little as possible till, till you, you, they stop beating you. So they taught you how to do that, what to say, how to do it, uh, different techniques of, of just being able to, again, like that. You, you, I don't know if you know, but in Vietnam, they came up with a tap code. So, again, instead of they couldn't get together, they had them separated, isolated in single cells. But they were able to come up with a guy designed a tap code, and they were able to spread it around so they actually could communicate by tapping out their words. Wow. So there's a tap code to where they can do that. And, it, you know, just that connection, again, that Chancellor was talking about is an immense thing of hope that keeps you alive. You know, when you're thinking you're in this all alone, especially if you are, you got to remember there are people out there that, you know, spiritually you have God to talk to as well. But when you have that, if you learn a tap code and anybody else in there learns it, now you have a way to communicate. And again, that thing of I'm not alone. We're in this together. These guys, you know, because you have days where you're like, and you, Chancellor, you may have had these where you're like, in the dumpster you know you just you're done you're finished and then you got your buddy over there is having a great day for some reason he's tapping you a code to go hey hang in there hang in there and then two days later that guy's like he's ready he's done he's had enough and that's the thing anytime i've been in that like they talk about the seal training in the same way is that you know if you have a buddy that can keep with you going you go twice as far twice as long because that guy keeps you going on the days i used to uh we rode a motorcycle 
uh, every day to base. And uh, we were going to do it all year long. It was in North Carolina. So it still got cold. It still rained. It wasn't like doing it in Alaska, but it still wasn't <laughs> easy to do. So uh, we did it for a whole year. But there was constantly times where he, he'd knock at my door, and I'm like, I'm not. We're getting the car. We're not going to take it. No, man, we said we we're going to do this. Let's, and so eventually it was, or I'd go down to his place and go, come on. We're going, no, John, I don't, yeah. So having that encouragement is a tremendous, a tremendous lift. As Chancellor, I think you said that get with somebody that you could actually felt like you were with it just changed a lot of things for you. No, nah, facts. So that's that's really a whole shift within the story. Like, as soon as I move to that new cell and I can talk to somebody, you can feel the energy shift within the story. Like, it's, yeah. uh, it's a lot more harmonious. It's still ugly, but, hey, you know what yeah. I'm saying? It's a lot more of, of a vibe now because it's like, okay, we can, you know what I'm saying? We can just tap in with somebody and just learn. It's just ain't all miserable. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? It's still well, we all it's together. The, but. It's the fact that you don't know when it's going to end is a huge player and how you mentally do that. If you know there's an end, you can almost always go, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. Yeah. But when like your situation or anybody else's that happens to, a prisoner of war, someone else getting thrown in jail in another country is is truly trying to say every day, this is not going to be the same thing forever. And if you keep that in, then that gives you hope that ignites you to be able to keep going. And that's a big okay. deal is, is not knowing it's going to last forever. No, that's, so, so do, you have, do you have days now where you're like, it's a bad day, but at least I'm not in a Beijing prison. Oh, man, that's every time I feel like things are just getting ugly. I'm like, damn, all this, this bad things happen back to back to back. But I'm like, hey, we'd have been down before. <laughs> we'd have been down before, bro. It's like, hey, hey, that was an all-time low, for real, for real. And I'm like, hey, it ain't, ain't nothing worse than that. It ain't nothing going to be worse than that, for real, for real, unless it's, I'm experiencing the death of something. But yeah. aside from that, I'm like, shit, ain't nothing going to be worse than Beijing Jail 6. No cap. <laughs> no cap. Wow. Yeah. Now, John, as we wrap this up, are there any other questions or thoughts you want to leave with Chancellor? Uh, so you, how how's your response been from the book as, as far as other people learning lessons or learning things that you did, like we talked about just now, the, the camaraderie and what that does, yeah. and, and looking at your day going, well, I – I, what, I'm not where Chancellor was. You know what I'm saying? How they <laughs> use it for a positive, hey, my day sucks really bad, but I'm not in China in a prison. So how's that been as far as your response with people being able to capture that and, and really live on it and grow with um, it? Just me uh, working. I work with a lot of youth. You know what I'm saying? So I'm in elementary school. A lot of them kids know that I'm a published author, best-selling author at that. You know what I'm saying? And they know what this, it's about, me getting locked up in China. Ain't no point of hiding anything from these kids. These kids is exposed to everything with the Internet. So it's like... Do they, do they, do those kids Google you? Oh, yeah. That's all you got to do. <laughs> yeah, that's all you got to do. Just Google me. Everything you need will pop up right there. So it's yeah. just like, ain't, no, ain't no, no sense of hiding it from them. I keep it all the way 100 with them. Um, and these kids, they need to see people... You know what I'm saying? They look like them doing things that people don't think is feasible. You know what I'm saying? Most yeah. people in my background, athletes, entertainment. Those are the main fields that we more than likely going to strive in. But, like, no, nah, that's not really the case. We can, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot of different avenues of fields that we can embark on. And a lot of people think that becoming a published author is this esoteric, godlike ability that only the special among us will ever be able to, you know what I'm saying, experience. Like, no, nah, it was, it's crazy. I first released 14 days and it was going crazy so many people was reaching out to me in regards to that had aspirations of being a published author their entire life and they just saw me do it and knock the thing at the parks so and now they just want they just like how did you do it you make it look so easy it really is quite simple it's, it's a process but it ain't nothing crazy especially self-publishing but that shit is easy so it's just like <laughs> you know what i'm saying just and now i coach people uh, you know what I'm saying, on my own publishing company and I offer service coaching people through the writing and uh, publishing process. So anybody out there with an idea or a concept for a story but not sure how to go about putting it on paper, I could walk you through that process. So say you've written a whole book and not sure how to go about publishing, I could walk you through that process too if need be. Or, or both of them. You know what I'm saying? I also uh, coach um, life coach uh, at risk teens in my county. So kids that have got arrested for drugs, you know what I'm saying? We use 14 days of Beijing as a part of our lessons to pull our life skills from, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and then I coach high school football on top of that. So <laughs> I got the babies during the day and then the teenagers on the back end. Uh, and they all, most of them follow me on Instagram and they see everything I got going on. So, uh, yeah, just being an uh, inspiration, you know what I'm saying, to, to the youth. Yeah, and it, just showing the them, hope like, that you offer. Ways. 
the hope that you offer people in so many different ways is amazing just by this experience and using it like that. Authors that go, I'll never get this book written. It's just, and you're like, no, no, you can't because you, because you've been there, they go, well, if he could do it and I talk to him or I do, you know, I can do it. You know what I'm saying? It just gives, it just puts people's hope on fire, which is amazing chance. So that's an, an amazing gift because a lot of times they won't do it unless they get that. And so you're giving yes. people just an amazing gift of, of hope to be able to challenge and, and meet those challenges like you did. So that's, it's a phenomenal story. I mean, we all have been through different experiences from traumatic to joyous to sad to um, exciting to all, you know, so all different types of experiences that have shaped and molded us into the individuals that we are today. And I feel like the best way, the best teaching life is your own experience. And you can learn from others as well. You don't have to personally go through it yourself. So, you know what I'm saying? Put your stories out there. Share your stories. You never know who it could benefit, who might be going through the same situation, already went through it, or is finna go through it. Little do they know. They might not have no type of uh, experience like yours, but it's still something they can take away from it just by how you chose to handle it or your thought process through going through it. So it's just like, yeah, it's, it's a lot that we can take away from each other. Like in football, we always say iron sharpens iron, each one teach one. So. Yeah, man, that's it. Just hustling and motivating. That's all I'm doing. Well, I just love it because that was what we talked about on the platform is get on there, share your story. You're going to give other people encouragement that, hey, this guy is here. I'm here. I'm starting back here. And anything you talk about, that story you have is yours, and it's powerful, and it can help other people to do things they would never do if you didn't speak up. So we try to get people to speak up about their story all the time, and I love what you said there because that's exactly what it does. Truly opens up the field to doors. It opens doors. It brings you up to where you think you can take that challenge, and it's just phenomenal what it can do. On me. And on top of that, it's like you already done went through it, so why not make a dollar off of it? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You ought to went through. You might as well make a dollar off of it. Come oh, on, you can make a dollar. That's good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The logic is strong with you, Chancellor. The logic is strong with you. <laughs> you know what I'm Come on. No, that's awesome. So, John, at the end, of, you're on technically my podcast. But we'll just use this for your podcast too. So, usually at the end of your podcast, you have a tradition. Oh, that's true. Okay, Chancellor. Now, here, uh, have you seen the new Top Gun movie? Uh. Uh-uh. Okay, so if you go see it, the old Top Gun movie uh, and the new Top Gun movie, to be really cool, and I know you want to be really cool because, you know, being in a prison in China is not that cool, but (laughs) you really want to be cool with the guys. So everybody's got to have a call sign, okay? So like in Top Gun, there's Maverick and Goose and all these different call signs. So uh, I'm going to give you a chance today to announce to the world what you think your call signs would be. Now, it is kind of a family show, so it, it's got to be fairly clean and, and fairly short to be able to use it. But uh, do you have a, a call sign that you think, uh, you know, like if you cook over the radio, it would be like, for me, it would be, mine was Hitch. Uh, so it would be Hitch Check, and they'd go 234. They'd go Maverick, and it would be 234, because so, there's three or four other guys flying with you. So I'm talking quite a while to give you a chance to not totally put you on the spot. But yeah. the, uh, we, we try to go, okay, so what are you going to announce today to the world that your call sign is? Now, usually you get assigned a call sign for doing something stupid. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay. Hey, this is you know, Idiot Joe right here. That's his call sign. So today, what, what do you think you might want to use as a call sign? So it's essentially like a nickname? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Exactly. So, um, sure. Lucky. Lucky Chance. Lucky hey, Chance. Cool. My character's name in uh, 14 Days in Beijing, Lucky Chance. That's pretty cool. Lucky so Chance cool. Zero One? Yeah, yeah, Lucky Chance Zero One. I love it. It's awesome, <laughs> bud. Okay, so that's permanent stamp on your forehead. Next time I see you, that's all I'm going to know you as, okay? I bet. Lucky Chance. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that's it. Like. Hey, before we wrap this up, Chancellor, or I should say, Lucky Chance Zero One, any <laughs> yes, parting sir. thoughts? Or where can people um, get your book, by the way, too? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, y'all, man, the best search engine we got, Google, Google <laughs> Chancellor K Jackson. Everything you need will pop up from my social media accounts to my website, ChancellorKJackson.com. My books are available on uh, Amazon as well as um, my website. Uh, if you want a signed copy. Order from my website. You order from Amazon. It's gonna come straight from them, and I ain't, ain't nothing I can do with that. Um, but uh, for my non-readers out there, I got the audio book for 14 Days in Beijing available on SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, Anchor, 
and Apple Podcasts, and I'm narrating it, so you can just get your popcorn ready and listen to that. It's a vibe for show. Any inspiring authors out there, visit ChancellorKJackson.com. We can sign up for a free consultation, and we can tap in, see if we're a good fit for each other, and bring that dream to reality. Um, and I want to leave y'all with this message uh, before we close out, and the message is from Nipsey Hussle. For y'all that don't know who Nipsey Hussle was, Nipsey Hussle was a mogul, philanthropist, philosopher, serial entrepreneur, well known for his clothes and his uh, music. And the quote goes, long-winded, running through this life like it was mine. Never settling, but setting every goal high. 1,000 burpees on the path to my own self-destruction or success. But what is a mistake without the lesson? You see, the best teacher in life is your own experience. And none of us know who we are until we fail. They say every person is defined by their reaction to any given situation. Well, who would you want to define you? Someone else? Or yourself? Whatever you choose to do, homie, get your heart to it. And stay strong. Oh, wow. Nice. Great ending. <laughs>